in a show that's driven by three female leads, running for eight seasons and with a costume budget of $20,000 per episode, you can imagine that the clothes were as much characters and charmed as the Halliwell sisters themselves. But before I go any further, I want to preface by saying that if you clicked on this video expecting a hate-filled rant full of pop feminist buzzwords like male gaze, objectification, or the dreaded problematic, well... The door's right over there, and it's open! I've talked before about how when Charmed transitioned from its gloomy, atmospheric season 1 to brighter, bolder season 2, there were many aesthetic changes, most obviously in the cinematography, but there was a noticeable change in the type of clothes you'd see the sisters wearing. Compare Prue's workplace outfits in season 1 to when she's giving Jack Sheridan a hard time for wearing shorts in the office in season 2. You can get away with wearing that, I can certainly get away with wearing this. Piper likewise was managing a restaurant in season 1, and then changed careers to run an establishment where you'd expect to see beautiful women in flattering nightwear more often. Phoebe stopped looking for a job too and went back to college, allowing her to wear whatever she liked for a while. Season 2 saw the hiring of Ailish Zabraski as the head of costume, and supposedly was when the network started demanding more skin. In seasons 3 and 4 it goes up a notch, and then by 5 and 6 it's a whole new ball game, with umpteen episodes involving a Halliwell sister being turned into something requiring a different funky outfit. Uh, and why do I always get stuck with the wig? 7 and 8 do see that lessening somewhat, but there's still plenty of skin on display. And this is quite a sticking point for a lot of fans. Not exactly your style. I, however, am not one of them. Look, maybe I'm old-fashioned, or maybe it's just because I'm a guy, but my attitude towards these things is… well, people can wear what they want. This costume happens to be a protest statement. Yeah, we had a network demanding more skin and a showrunner with umpteen icky stories about him, and a recent revelation from Holly Marie Combs about how they tried to make her wear push-up bras with her wardrobe, but if you come at this only knowing pop feminism from a BuzzFeed article and forgetting the cultural and historical context, then your conclusion is… Sexy ladies bad because reasons. So first, let's dismantle that pesky theory that was never meant to be a theory. Male gaze was coined by Laura Mulvey in her 1974 essay Visual Pleasure and Narrative Cinema, and it was rooted in frustration with how some films of the day loved their long, lingering shots of the female anatomy. The theory, however, is flawed because it's rooted in outdated second-wave feminist beliefs and treats the male experience like a monolith. This is the critical flaw in male gaze theory. It's based on stereotypes regarding sexuality. For comparison... Male gaze theory is over 40 years old. It came into fashion when many people still thought homosexuality was a mental illness. It's been rendered essentially obsolete by intersectionality theory, which teaches us that you can't treat individual men as though all men are the same. Furthermore, the theory states that the male gaze avoids things that men are assumed to not like looking at, and if we apply that to Charmed… Well, do you really want to pick your original hill to die on? Phoebe? We need to talk. Yes, we do. And then there's the fallacy often used by the sex-negative side stating that no real woman would wear that, which falls apart the second you look at a red carpet video. And not to mention the backhanded implication that you're anti-feminist the second you dress skimpy, to which I say it's time for a history lesson. The fashion of a period is often the first thing that marks something as a time capsule. And that's very important, because it is always a response to what's going on in the world. The 70s saw the popularity of afros and natural hair as a reflection of the Black Power era, where straightened hair was now seen as an outward expression of assimilation, and so letting one's natural curls grow symbolised how you were embracing your roots and reclaiming power. And this actually formed Pam Grier's look in the action movies that made her a star. Likewise, the miniskirts came into fashion in the 60s alongside the rise of the women's movement, where it was now socially acceptable to show that much skin, and this was reflected in how the original Star Trek showed the female crew members wearing them as part of their uniforms. Yeah, this was Gene Roddenberry's personal fantasy, and he really liked making the skirts as short as possible, but the actresses liked the costumes, with Grace Lee Whitney welcoming the chance to show off her figure, and Nichelle Nichols seeing it as a sign that in the future, a woman would be respected for her abilities, regardless of what she wore. So what about the 90s? This was the girl power era. Sometimes spelled this way after the rise of riot girl subculture in the early part of the decade, created in response to the Anita Hill hearings of 1991, merging punk music with feminist issues and redefining what it meant to be a woman. The latter half of the decade saw it reaching the pop market with the arrival of British girl group sensation The Spice Girls. 
Conceived as an alternative to what was expected of pop stars of the day, each member of the quintet was given her own distinct identity, but the differences weren't used to divide them. For example, Melanie Chisholm, aka Sporty Spice, was given a tomboyish, somewhat lesbian-coded persona, in contrast to Victoria Adams' more fashionable aesthetic. But neither was seen as more or less than the others, and the emphasis was on different types of girls supporting each other, and showing that there was no one way to be female. The Spice Girls and the Girl Power era promoted independence both in terms of what they wanted to do for business and pleasure. Bare midriffs and crop tops were a staple of late 90s fashion, and at the time were visual shorthand for women who knew exactly what they wanted, and weren't going to be told otherwise. If you can work this equation, then I guess I'll have to show you the door. The 90s was all about subverting the Madonna whore complex that had been prevalent for so long, where one could either be a saintly good girl or a vampy bad girl. Take beloved heroine Jessica Rabbit, who was two years before the 90s, but formative for a lot of millennial and Gen X women, which I'll get to. I'm not bad, I'm just drawn that way. She's designed to look like a classic femme fatale who uses her wiles to seduce men and screw them in the other way, so of course she's the prime suspect in her husband being framed for murder, and assumed to be having an affair. But the big twist is that Jessica is innocent, and actively working to save her husband, whom she loves very much. What are you seeing, that guy? He makes me laugh. So the film presents this very sexy lady, drawn to resemble a female villain archetype as a woman of valour and virtue, and a loving wife. If you're underestimating the impact that Jessica Rabbit had, I'd like to introduce my friend's song to explain in a little more detail. We interrupt this video about the fashion of Charmed to talk about Jessica Rabbit. Look, I could probably write an essay, or five, about Jessica. I grew up very Christian, very repressed, and very curvy, none of which is a recipe for happiness, especially when you add in an extremely sensual nature. It actually led to me being very miserable for a very long time. Long story short, I was saved by pinup art, burlesque, and Jessica Rabbit. I've said before that Jessica may well be one of the best characters to come out of the Disney oeuvre, and that's an opinion I stand by. I'm not bad, I'm just drawn that way is one of those lines that's deceptively complex. It's a reminder not to be deceived by appearances, but it's more than that. It's also a lament for how people judge her. Jessica is more than the big boobs and the vampish behavior. She can play the vixen, but still be the doting wife who truly adores her husband. And as someone who falls into both those categories, I can't tell you how freeing it was to realize I didn't have to choose one or the other. I could be both. But even as she embraces the attitude and look of the femme fatale, she's aware of the dangers that come with it, and the assumptions people make. Disney fans in general are likely aware of the trading pins. Over the years, she's become a fashion icon with different outfits from various uniforms around the park to iconic Hollywood costumes like Marilyn Monroe's seven-year itch dress to Halloween pins of her dressed as various Disney characters. Unfortunately, Jessica hasn't been untouched by the current attitude towards the feminine figure. It's honestly disheartening how many people disregard her as eye candy to be objectified. You know, the exact thing her character arc is supposed to make you realize you're not supposed to do. Because heaven forbid women show any cleavage or allow any hint that they're sexual beings. I spent so many years wrestling with the shame of my own sexuality brought on by religious dogma. Ironically, it seems like I overcame it just in time for society to start shaming me for it. Mary Jane Watson isn't allowed to be a supermodel anymore. Jessica Rabbit has to cover up, because the Madonna whore complex is back in full force. And I can't help but think that part of what motivates the change is, well, jealousy. Because I remember being repressed and self-conscious, seeing women in comic books and thinking that I couldn't be comfortable in a relationship with a man who reads comics because I would feel inferior to the women in them. It's an extremely toxic, immature mentality, but I think it's what a lot of women feel deep down. They complain about the male gaze because they feel they can't compete with what they've been told is what men really want. And it's such a lie. But for all our talk about embracing real women, it seems as if we've just become more neurotic about it. 
I could say more, but I wouldn't want to overstay my welcome. So we now return to our irregularly scheduled programming. Disney continued this trend when the 90s actually happened. Princess Jasmine gets a scene where she seduces Jafar to help Aladdin, while still being presented as a virtuous and open-minded young woman willing to look past class differences and fall in love with a poor street rat. And getting this brilliant moment. How dare you! All of you, standing around deciding my future? I am not a prize to be won! Meg from Hercules is another apparent femme fatale, but given an arc and backstory more compelling than the lead character, and she subverts the cliché of the femme fatale dying, because the climax is all about bringing her back to life. And then there's Esmeralda from The Hunchback of Notre Dame, who might be the only Disney character to get both a pole dancing scene and a song highlighting how good and compassionate she is. What do they have against people who are different anyway? These are three heroines with bad girl designs and seductress character traits, but all presented as strong and virtuous, as well as having moments where they refute the advances of men who feel entitled to them. Well, you know how men are. They think no means yes, and get lost means take me, I'm yours. Outside of Disney, Space Jam Legacy got in a spell of hot water when Lola Bunny was redesigned, and director Malcolm D. Lee said of the original, why was she dressed like that? And the answer to his intended rhetorical question was, because everyone was. Bear midriffs were normalized back then. So in that context, why is she wearing a crop top, Malcolm D. Lee? Because people wore crop tops back then! Because it was a reaction to the reality that we had to all become much more overt, much more aggressive, much more open with our sexuality. And while we're on Lola, <laughs> her first scene shows her refuting Bugs' attempt to sexualize her and commanding respect by demonstrating her talent at basketball, and then saying, don't ever call me doll. She doesn't give him a chance until he actively takes a hit for her, and indicates that he sees her more than something to drool over, giving an interesting message that she's fine with him being attracted to her, as long as he respects her as well. Wow, I'm giving a serious academic discussion on Space Jam. And in live action, we go to the cult classic from the year 2000, Coyote Ugly, which Charmed had an episode nodding to. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh. Dashed. The bar in the title is a real place, opened by Lil Lovell, who Maria Bello's character is a loose portrayal of. The gimmick was that the bar was run by women who danced in tight leather pants, pandering to the male patrons to encourage the men to spend as much as possible. Despite the trailer emphasising the leather pants, the film was all about sisterhood, female independence, and empowerment. With the protagonist being a literal shrinking violet with stage fright, and the table dancing helps her come out of her shell enough to pursue her singing dreams, her co-workers in the bar help and support her, giving a women supporting women message, so of course most journalists attack the actresses with that familiar buzzword, objectification. Maria Bello clapped back, saying, It was very rare to have a movie that centered on all women, that was a female-led story that was all about female friendship and dreams and empowerment. Cycling back to the music industry for a moment, I found myself revisiting a certain famous collaboration. <laughs> Considered one of the most iconic music videos of the 2000s, it is also a wash in corsets and lingerie, and it is magnificent. All four divas have made a point that their intent was to focus on female pleasure. Not a single man appears in the video, and it's all about these four declaring themselves sexy and powerful, and doing so for their own happiness. Quoth Christina Aguilera, who at the time was trying to, to transition away from the squeaky clean pop princess label she'd been assigned, The message was awesome, because every woman wants to feel good in their own skin. Every woman wants to own their sexuality, whether you put on a corset or not. Before to be sexualized meant that you would be labelled, and to own your sexuality meant you would be slut-shamed. Maya agreed, offering her two cents. The moment was very empowering, because women are usually pitted against each other, especially in entertainment. There was none of that to my recollection. It was truly about coming together, being woman, being slightly over the top, expressing ourselves. Hmm, it's almost as if women dress for themselves and when they do so you can go, okay, good for you, and not default to, it must be to please men and that's bad. And in a series about escapism and empowerment, it's all the more relevant. 
the modest wardrobes in Charm Season 1 reflect the sisters' level of power at the start of the series. They've had their magic bound since childhood, and grown up in an unstable home, with their lives still in disarray when we meet them. As their magic is awakened, their wardrobes and appearances become more attractive and glamorous to correspond with the growth of their powers and confidence. We saw this similar evolution in the film that inspired the show, the beloved cult classic, The Craft. It freaked the studio out because we shot the stuff from the beginning of the film, at the beginning, all that the school stuff, and I think they thought we were looking pretty dowdy. All four actresses were dressed down pre-empowerment, with the clothes becoming more flattering the stronger they got. Did you happen to notice that the more powers we got, the shorter our skirts got? And that's true. And yeah, the network and Brad Kern pushed for more skin, but Charmed was also unique in that the actresses actually had a say in what they wore. Holly Marie Combs did tell a story about finding push-up bras in her wardrobe choices in a not-so-subtle message from the higher-ups, but rather than going with it, instead went braless as a form of rebellion, and she maintains that it was one of the rare shows of the day where they could say they didn't want to wear makeup on a particular day or choose their own outfits. So Eilish and I would go on these shopping sprees, uh, and, uh, um, uh, and it was unbelievable and amazing, and, and actually right towards the end I started Shannon Doherty frequently picked out her wardrobe too. Don't quote me on this, and I can't find a source, but I remember years ago reading that most of Paige's season 4 outfits came from Rose McGowan's closet too. The actresses were also given much more leeway with their hair than a lot of the other shows of the day. Do you have any idea how much this would cost in the salon? After Felicity's racings tanked in the second season, the WB blamed it on the admittedly very unflattering haircut Kerry Russell got, and instated a rule that no young stars could change theirs without permission from the studio president. Rose McGowan, however, impulsively dyed her hair red right before season 5, casually suggesting this explanation. I mean, look at your hair, it's still red from the potion you blew up last night. Then changed colours twice in the next season, and Alyssa Milano went through about five different styles in season 4 before getting a drastic pixie cut in season 6. And as easy it is to form a narrative of the actresses being forced into wearing whatever, it's actually more nuanced. Kiss the hand of the page! Rose McGowan initially called the goddess costumes from the season 5 finale her least favourite, but has since changed her mind and dubbed them awesomely extra. She still hates the wood nymph one, though. The mermaid costume from A Witch's Tale that led to Krista Vernoff eventually leaving the show? That's Alyssa Milano's favourite episode. And this line from Val Halley of the Dolls is amusing. Because she hates wearing those costumes as much as we do. Mm-hmm. Because Holly Marie Combs called that the one outfit she wished she'd kept. That doesn't mean I'm always on board with skin being thrown in there for its own sake. Hey! I'm walking here! Phoebe's Cinderella dress completely fails at being sexy in any way, and it takes away from the episode's fun. The Mummy episode likewise feels pretty gratuitous, and the end result is more degrading than sexy. But even then, it is an evil being taking over Phoebe's body and violating it, so I guess that's part of the package, rather than the other transformations, which were all about fun and escapism. Prue's makeover while impersonating Miss Hellfire, by contrast, is beloved by most fans, because it's hammered home that Prue is having fun and living out a fantasy, and pretending to be a sexy bad girl goes along with it. I've seen complaints about the sexiness, but I have to ask. If the character is getting pleasure out of something that she's chosen to do, and isn't hurting anyone, and your only problem is that it's revealing... Isn't the real problem you? I have nothing for these gratuitous bits of page in A Witch's Tale, and the obviousness of trying to give Rose McGowan a wet t-shirt scene just makes for unintentional comedy. Not to mention, in the workplace? But we can focus on that and how it intersects with the show's escapist themes. Prue, for example, is mainly in suits and modest clothes in season 1, with a huge change in workplace attire the next year, rocking into the office in get-ups like this. But actually, you could interpret Prue's season 2 wardrobe as a reflection of her outgrowing Bucklands, and eventually deciding to become a freelancer. Her clothes seeming inappropriate for an office environment serves to make Prue look even more incongruous with her surroundings, because she herself feels out of place there and wants to move on. After all, there is an episode where she happily escapes her responsibilities by dressing up in the contents of a hit woman's closet. Maybe I'm working. More like you're working it. I also have to give credit to this statement from the show's subreddit, commenting on both Prue and Piper's costume evolution. They start loosening up Prue's style, leading up to her departure from Buckland. Her departure as the responsible, buttoned up head of the family. We see her style evolve into a fearless kind of sexy as she becomes a fearless witch. But as all this is happening with Prue, 
Piper becomes a business owner and becomes the show's long-term romantic focus. Her style evolves to become mature versus meek, and as time goes on, even while Prue is still alive, they establish Piper as the matriarch of the family. Prue is single and quite literally kicking ass. Phoebe is chasing boys of herself. Meanwhile, Piper is the family focus. She gets the husband and the babies. She gets the house too eventually. All their styles reflect these storylines. If Charmed were going for the hyper-realism of a show like Peaky Blinders, maybe it would matter that some of these outfits are a bit too glamorous for their lifestyles, but it's all part of the escapist fantasy nature of it all. Just like another Aaron Spelling created franchise, which is also dismissed as something that was only popular because of eye candy, when in actuality, its fans appreciated it as one of the first action series with strong female leads. This is a tough one, Angels. Doubt if I could do it myself, even if I wanted to. Needs the feminine touch. Charlie's Angels was a product of the women's movement and second wave feminism, designed specifically to be an escapist series about women getting the chance to do anything and save the day. Just like films such as Coffee, Cleopatra Jones, and Foxy Brown came out of the Black Power era, these works are time capsules of the eras that spawned them, and the fashion reflects the values of those eras. And look, we can talk about these clothing choices until we're mystique in the face, but I want to highlight a very specific audience reaction phenomenon that was fascinating to me for a few years. TV Tropes calls it best known for the fan service referring to the presence of some eye candy being all that's remembered about a work. It would be all too common to reference Basic Instinct, but I'll go with 1953's From Here to Eternity, which is a fantastic war drama and contains iconic performances from Deborah Carr, Burt Lancaster, and especially Montgomery Clift. But the most remembered scene is this steamy kiss that lasts for three seconds. Going back to Charlie's Angels, Farrah Fawcett wore a swimsuit only once in her time on the show, and that's when Jill was pretending to be a swimming instructor. Jacqueline Smith did wear bikinis, but was still dressed pretty modestly, and Kate Jackson was envisioned specifically as the conservatively dressed smart angel, and when Aaron Spelling cast Holly Marie Combs in Charmed, he told her that she would be the Kate Jackson figure of the show, there to be more modest and conservative. Which is why you rarely saw her midriff, and Coyote Piper is her only real fanservice scene. Which is more important than you'd think. The choice to do or wear what you want, not what you feel pressured to. And even with the other three, it was never just skimpy outfits all the time. There was definitely an increase in spaghetti strap tops in the sixth season, and disregarding the fact that everyone was wearing them then anyway, even so, Phoebe would still have plenty of modest sweaters and long coats. In My Three Witches, she spends the episode wearing a business suit. In Carpe Demon, she wears these three distinct outfits throughout the episode. <laughs> That's very sweet, <laughs> isn't it? It seems like these characters just like clothes and looking pretty, and there ain't nothing wrong with that. I am so impressed that you can make a protest statement and show cleavage all at the same time. Thanks. Amazing. But I want to round things off with another pair of real-life quotes that made the news in 2021, after Krista Vernoff confessed that she stepped down as writer and producer after the fifth season's transformation episodes, not wanting to be part of something that she felt was bad for the world. She clarified that she meant the objectifying notes from the network were bad for the world, not the show itself, after Alyssa Milano intervened. I hope we didn't make something that was bad for the world for eight years. I think we gave permission to a generation of women to be themselves and to be strong and own their sexuality. I'm so proud of what this show meant to so many." Holly Marie Combs agreed, saying this, I can attest 1000% Charmed was not bad for the world. The reasons and people are too long to list. And the fact that we can still stand up for ourselves and the show and the people who love it proves this. I never cared what producer or exec wanted us more naked for their money. And I still don't. We knew how to rally against it and found our power. And still do. I feel like the 2010s saw a pivot towards this weird hatred of traditional femininity and female sexuality. I would not waste my years planning dances and masquerades with the other noble ladies. Now Disney princesses can't fall in love or get married. Every heroine has to be not like other girls. Adaptations of comics take heroines with funky costumes and make them dull. And now anything from 20 or 30 years ago that showed women exploring their sexuality and learning to own and embrace it is labelled problematic. 
Charmed never got respect from the mainstream because it was a female-oriented show that had all three main characters be powerful and traditionally feminine, even though it managed to attract significant male fans for that coveted multi-demographic appeal, and it gets dismissed by pop feminism both because of its focus on romance and because you see plenty of skin without it being shown as a bad thing, even though all three female leads were strong and capable and presented as fully in control of their sexuality with an emphasis on women supporting women. Or as I said to another friend, they hate it because it's the good guys showing cleavage. Unlike Once Upon a Time, where the dichotomy was so clear it was hilarious. Maybe you should go for something a bit less evil? I guess I would just like to live in a world where people can wear whatever they want and be respected for their character and actions, rather than what's in their wardrobe. And taking all of the above into consideration, that's kind of the world that seemed to exist in Charmed itself.